trusting God even in everything and trusting him for even the most minute um, task that we do. Happy New Year! Hey everyone, my name is Carter and I'm the Southwest Campus Pastor. This is my wife, Sarah, and we've got two little ones, Peter and Dorothy, and another one on the way. It's New Year's Eve weekend. How excited that we are in the midst of entering another year. It's interesting how we often, maybe without realizing it, begin to think about how this coming year could be different. Maybe we want to lose some bad habits or gain some new constructive disciplines. What we choose to do in one day, the small strung together choices that we make in each 12 to 24 hours in a day, show us who we really are. To make any noticeable lasting change takes commitment, discipline, and focus so that we're able to hone in on our goal, but it also requires sacrifice. This may mean doing less of other things we love, like watching hours of our favorite show or sleeping in. Our relationship with Jesus is similar to creating a new habit. There are things we must give up and decisions we must make that are difficult because they go against what we naturally crave in our sinful, selfish nature. But we know that if we do make those hard choices, our relationship with God will grow and strengthen. Luke 9 23 says, and Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Out of this change, we will be able to more clearly hear God's voice and know what it is he desires for us. But what's essential to understand is that this process of life transformation begins within us and then moves outward to those around us. If you own a Bible, why don't you go ahead and get it open to Deuteronomy 6 with us this morning. You can also use the Bible app or find the Bible on the website, but there's something special about holding the scriptures right in your hands. At this point in the Bible, we are with a man named Moses and a group of people called the Israelites. They were God's chosen people who he promised to make a great nation out of. At this point in the story in Deuteronomy, the Israelites were about to enter the land promised to them by God after wandering through the desert for the last 40 years. Not because they just wanted to go for a long walk, but because of their disobedience to God. The last time they were in the same spot was 40 years earlier when the Israelites refused to enter the land because they were actually scared of the nations that lived there. So as punishment, God said the whole generation would not live to experience the promised land. Now, at this point in Deuteronomy, the last of that disobedient generation has died. And there is a new group of Israelites who are either not born yet or too young to remember the commandments that God gave Moses when they were camped at Mount Sinai. Moses was also told that he would not go into the land with this new generation. So as one of the last acts of leadership for this group, he calls the people together to recovenant or recommit themselves to God. And he reminds them what it means to truly follow God. Now, these commands were not just meant for the current group, but they were meant to be observed and passed down from generation to generation so that multiple things would happen. First, the generations to come would know what it means to follow God and put him at the very core of who they were. The second was to instill reverence for God. And the third was for them to thrive and multiply. Today, we are just looking at the beginning of this command, understanding who God is, how we follow Jesus and putting him at the center, which was the foundation for faith within the family of Israel. Deuteronomy 6, 4 verse 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This seems very simple, but at the same time, let's not miss how intense this command really is. You see, saying Israel was inconsistent as followers of God would have been an understatement. For the last 41 years, ever since they left the enslavement in Egypt, they had been bouncing back and forth between listening and honoring God to disobeying, grumbling, creating other idols of worship. There are many competing gods in our lives that demand our loyalty and our attention. We are constantly being lured by the power of, to influence, of success, of wealth, of authority, 
being plugged in 24 seven and not to mention all the material things we can crave to make sure our exterior image is up to date. These things are often what we bow to and have gained control of our attention. The same was similar with the Israelites. Other gods were competing for their attention. So Moses was being crystal clear as he could with this new generation. He begins with saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now that word hear in Hebrew is Shema, which doesn't just mean listen. It also means to pay attention, to respond and obey. The beginning part of this scripture is about the chosen people acknowledging that God, whom we must depend on and to whose command we must yield, is the only one. And his power is infinite and incomparable. It was a recognition of the supremacy of God. Moses describes what full submission to God looks like, and it begins with love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Truly loving God will change every part of our lives. A covenant commitment is demonstrated through love, not the emotion, but instead the action. For those of you that are married, think about how you uphold your covenant or promise of faithful marriage that you made with your spouse. It's not by feelings because sometimes I don't feel like doing things for my husband, <laughs> although I love him, but by actions through love, serving one another and putting their needs ahead of our own. If you're single, whether an adult or a teenager, the greatest way you can love your friends and family around you is by serving them. Commentator Peter Craigie says that an all-encompassing love for God is expressed in willing, joyful obedience. But what does that look like? What is willing, joyful obedience? Well, Moses mentions three different aspects of a person, their heart, their soul, and their strength. Between these three parts of a human, our entirety is made up. Now in English, these all seem pretty straightforward. However, this passage in Deuteronomy was written in Hebrew, not in English. So let's unpack these three things. So first, the heart. In Hebrew, this word is lev, and it is a very robust understanding of heart. It is a generator of life, but it's also the center of your intellectual and emotional life. Now, at this point in history, the Israelites had no concept of the brain and no word to describe it. And they thought that all human intellect flowed through the heart. In your heart is where you know, understand, and where wisdom lives. So when Moses is commanding the Israelites to love God with all their heart, it is an all-encompassing act of the inner person. It is loving God with our bodies, our intellect, our emotions, and our choices. For all of us, this means learning to honor God with our actions. It means showing love to those around us and to use our minds to creatively think of ways to serve others. It means taking every thought captive and put under the submission of Christ. It means aligning our affections with that of God. What could this look like for you? Or maybe you don't know what it means to align yourself or your family with God. So your first step is to learn to simply spend time with him. If you have children, Something that you can do is a daily Bible time with them. You can pick up a children's Bible or just your Bible and learn about the different stories and how we can learn to be more like Jesus through those examples. One of the best ways to teach our children is to thoroughly learn a Bible story on our own and then tell it to our children with the original scriptures, but also supplementing with pictures drawn on a whiteboard or a piece of paper. These don't have to be fancy or hour long moments. We have all people having a four and a two year old and a baby coming know that this is highly unlikely. But again, the small moments we use every day, whether it's at the table or in the car are what will change us. What we do is we spend about 10 minutes praying with our own kids. We read a story or two from their Bible. They always ask for two. And then we have kids Bible start cards that have a Christian theology term and a memory verse that we learn together. 10 minutes might not feel like much, but we start somewhere and slowly build up this discipline with our family. And now honestly, our kids look forward to that time every morning and they beg us to do it. Although one of the biggest factors in all of this is our kids seeing us reading our own Bibles and dedicated to our own spiritual formation in relationship with Jesus. Loving God begins within us. It is our heart posture towards him, desiring to be with him, spending time talking with him. What begins within our inner person eventually spills out through our actions. The second part that we're, that we're gonna look at about what it means to love God is with our soul. 
Now, when you think of soul, I'm sure that there will be a variety of ideas that people will have. Some might think of a ghost-like thing that's trapped in our bodies until we die. Others may consider it more like the deeper, more intimate parts of you, the things that make us who we are. In Hebrew, soul is actually translated as nefesh, which actually means throat. In other parts of the Bible, this word is used to describe longing for food or for a slave who has a chain around their neck. But since what goes in and out of your throat is what your body is sustained by, this word nefesh is also used to describe the whole person. So where we may consider ourselves as having a soul, the correct use of the word would actually be that we are a soul, a living, breathing, physical being. To love God with all our soul means to offer our entire selves, our abilities and our shortcomings, our appetite and desires to love God and people. It means beginning our day asking God to make us aware of what he is doing and where he wants us to join him. If you are a software engineer, write code with all you got and do it with a gospel lens. If you're a stay-at-home parent teaching care for your kids with all you got and do it with a gospel lens. Use your whole person to do the things that only you can do. And as you do it, acknowledge it as an act of worship to God, looking for the different moments where he wants you to step in and engage as his representative. The last word we're going to look at is strength, which in Hebrew is me'od, which means very or much. This is interesting that our English Bibles have translated it as strength because the purpose of this word me'od is actually to come alongside and give emphasis to other words. For example, in Genesis 1, when God is creating the first five days of creation, he calls it good. But on the sixth day, when he creates people, he calls them me'od, good, or very good. Moses' command to love with all of our strength is not limited to loving through what we are physically capable of doing, but instead it means that in all we do, in every opportunity, whether that is something physical or social, an economic opportunity, any opportunity at all, is a chance to use all of ourselves to honor and love God and people. Our faith is not a once a week thing. Our devotion and apprenticeship to Jesus primarily happens outside of the church and in the home, both individually and with others. When we take Peter and Dorothy, our kids to the doctor, our doctor checks in about their physical development and their learning growth. And our children's and friends and family's spiritual growth should be of equal concern to us. A few weeks ago, I was singing along to a song on the radio and Carter looked over at me and said, how do you know this song? We've never heard this before. We don't have this on our playlist. And I replied with, I have, I actually have no idea. I have no idea where I've heard this, but I had absorbed the content and the lyrics of this song unknowingly, simply from hearing it playing in the background as I was driving. The things that we see as little really aren't the little things when they happen every single day. It's the same with forming habits with our faith. It may start with sitting down to read the Bible or praying at supper. And it may seem difficult at first, and you may forget some days. That's okay. But if you remain consistent over time, you will be able to look back after a month or two and see how you have changed. Maybe the way you think is different. Maybe you are able to control your anger more. Maybe prayer begins to become your first response instead of your last resort. We have begun to say it more here at FAC that we will, and we'll continue to say it, that our purpose is to join Jesus in the renewal of all things. This starts with us at home. This starts with us giving ourselves to the cause of Christ, loving him with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength. That is an all-encompassing and joyful obedience. I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrases this verse. He says, love God, your God, with all your whole heart, Love him with all that's in you. Love him with all you've got. So if you were to write down what you currently do in a day and show it to somebody else, would they be able to tell if you love Jesus by what your day looks like? 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. So what needs to change in order for your love for Jesus to be number one? For our love of God to flow from everything we do. Is it time in scripture and prayer and building up that discipline? Is it changing the content of what you read, watch, and listen to? Is it intentional conversations with the people around you? 
what will we change within us that will then ripple out through our thoughts and actions? We should be marked, easily recognizable as people that know and love Jesus. So I'm asking myself, and I encourage you to do this as well. If somebody in your life wanted to know about Jesus, would they know to come to me? Would they know to come to you? And would we be ready and willing if they did? Maybe the spiritual growth can start by setting reminders around your home, writing scripture, putting them in common places like the kitchen sink or the bathroom sink. So whenever you wash dishes or brush your teeth, you can be meditating on these scriptures as they're right in front of you. Maybe it means leaving your Bible out in the open so that every time you see it, it's a trigger to sit down and spend time reading the word of God. Maybe it's having a family devotion night once a week over dinner or praying over your family as you fold their laundry. If you don't know where to begin, a great resource is a book called Habits of the Household by Justin Whitmore Early. He walks through what a day could look like focusing on Jesus and discipling our families and friends. And he ends each chapter with, the, with a suggestion on how to implement all of these things. Whatever our change is, we must make an intentional decision to have our faith thrive first in our hearts so that it can grow in our homes and beyond.